All right, so now we need to do a final checks in terms of the formatting and references. And then we're not going to update the table of contents and figures. We're actually going to insert one. All right, so let's see what we need to do. Um, we're going to do these two last. This one I've already ticked off, but I just want to double check that we've done this correctly. And I want to maybe suggest something else we can do to be safe. So um, the external hyperlinks are easy because we just hyperlink to a spreadsheet or a database in your findings. But this one actually says we need a hyperlink uh, bookmark or cross reference to navigate within the report. OK, so if you've done a cross reference, where you actually, let's say, for example, over here, um, somewhere, do you remember I said see figure two and you can actually click and go to figure two. Um, this you can do. I'm just worried that not all teachers will necessarily know to go check for this because remember a cross reference is basically invisible unless you switch on um, field codes. So unless they actually um, see it like that. So Unless you, unless you actually discuss this with your teacher, this might not be the safest way to ensure that you get that mark. The other way that I thought you could perhaps get this mark to be 100% safe is maybe at the end of the bibliography, you could put something like back to top and insert a hyperlink that lets people go back to the top. And you can decide if you want to make it back to the top of like the very top of the page. Um, you know, if you go put in a link, there's an option for placing this document to actually go to the top of the document or to choose one of the headings at the top. Just be careful. We might be changing this table of contents heading. So maybe go to introduction or just choose top of document. That might be a good, uh, a safer way to navigate within the document. You could also always put this in the footer or something like that, but yeah, that's another idea for getting that mark and being safe that um, you'll definitely get that mark um, no matter if your teacher knows to look for a cross-reference or not because they might not necessarily think to look for that. Right, the appropriate readable font size, if you used normal text size, then that's fine. If you used styles, these two will be 100%. The one thing here that we need to look at now is appropriate word spacing, basic punctuation, and then spelling or grammar mistakes. I would say first do your spelling and grammar check and then we can double check this one. So no spelling or grammar mistakes highlighted. Let's go check how to do that. If you did in English, please select everything, control all and double check that your language is set to English South Africa. So perhaps just select it again, deselect this, do not check spelling or grammar. I don't know why sometimes it comes on and say, okay, make sure everything is English South Africa. And then we're going to go to review and uh, we're going to go to spelling and grammar. Now you're going to actually do the spelling and the grammar. So go through everything and check what you can all change throughout the entire document. Obviously, if it's wrong, you can say ignore. You'll know, you know, is it a name? Is it whatever? Um, are they interpreting something wrong? But this will help you solve a lot of the issues with your punctuation as well. But please go through this process completely. If you're doing it in Afrikaans, all right, so you're going to select everything, select Afrikaans. And I just want to show you this. You'll see my Afrikaans has the little tick mark next to it. That means my spell checker is actually installed for my Afrikaans. If it's not, you need to download the Afrikaans proofing tools. Oh, do you see that? It's already got one wrong there. Um, you need to download the Afrikaans proofing tools. So it would probably have already suggested that to you at some point where it brought this little bar at the top that said um, you're typing in a language that it doesn't have the right proofing tools for, where it actually suggested you download it. If it brings that up, you can just select that. Otherwise, ask your teacher for help to install the Afrikaans proofing tools so that you can run it through the Afrikaans spell checker. Now that you've set the language to Afrikaans, you can go through the spelling and grammar check and go through all of it. Here that I'm at the bibliography, obviously I'm just going to like ignore everything or I'll actually set that section to English. So I'll resume and now I can start from the top. Now I know that a lot of these words are supposed to actually be one word. So I'm going to ignore or I can actually even add to my dictionary, but it's going to help me to check uh, Ooh, online. Maybe I can rather say online. 
Right, so that's how we're going to fix it and double check that you've done your whole document correctly. So this one is correct now. Now we need to check the word spacing and the basic punctuation. Now here I want to show you this, zooming in here. So this is actually a good example. You'll see, and this was done automatically because it's a, um, caption, uh, a citation, there is a single space before the bracket that's open. There's no space before a full stop. There's no space before a comma. Okay, so like here as well. There's no space before a full stop. If I had a comma in here, there'd be no space before a comma. If this was an exclamation mark or a question mark or whatever, there would be no space before it, but a single space after it. The only time there is a space before a character is if it's a um, bracket or if it's a, um, I don't know what this is called in English, like a ondagstreep um, in Afrikaans, um, when it's that, like when you like splitting the sentence in two. Okay, so these are the only times when you're actually using a space in front of some kind of punctuation. All right, so please double check your document for that, but most of it should have been fixed when you did the grammar check. And okay, now we're going to check the captions. So next up, captions. So we've done captions for the pictures. So you've done the captions here at the top, the captions for the pictures. All right, and for the findings. Yeah, all right. Um, if you're doing it in Afrikaans and it's uh, defaulted to English, it's not a train smash, but if you set the language of the document to Afrikaans, it's probably going to default to Afrikaans. And um, the thing is, we also, I don't know if you saw, but it says here, it says appropriate um, uh, captions correctly inserted for all tables and figures. All right. So we need to insert these for tables as well. So now what you need to do is you're going to click on this four-headed four arrow at the top of the table and you can right click, you're going to choose this insert caption. Um, let me just show you on this side. Um, it doesn't matter if it's at the top or the bottom. Uh, the default for tables are above it because a table can go over two pages. Right, so you can leave it like that, it's fine. And then we can just say, and then you can just call it whatever it actually, whatever it contains and above is completely fine. That is the default and that's actually where it's supposed to be, but you won't be penalized if it is at, at the bottom. The reason it is above is because it can go over two pages. And then if you are directed to the caption using a cross reference, then you'll go to the bottom of it instead of at the top. So logically it's better to do it at the top. Right, so you'll be inserting the table captions for all of the different tables. So literally every single one, you'll have one, two, three, four at least, and possibly even this one. I think let's just be safe, five. All right, so do that for all of those. All right, now, before we're gonna add the automatic table of figures, um, and that's basically exactly the same as uh, table, other tables appendices correctly inserted. We're just gonna check this. Supporting documentation added as a part of the document appendices clearly distinguishable from the main document for example different sections restarting page numbers descriptive headers or footers so you'll see i've done mine like that my headers so at here i just have page numbers and in my addendums or like at the here at the bottom i have appendices of by law i have that as an actual um, header or a footer and the page numbers restart here it restarts at one or a, like a roman number restarts at a b c and it continues like that so that's the mark that you get for that over there i would say instead of just doing page numbers to be safe do a heading as well over there and for that you'll have to unlink the sections to make sure that it doesn't mess up the top sections as well where you have your general report now lastly what we need to do then is our table of figures and our table of contents so we've done everything else and then we're done guys so we're gonna go to table of contents and with table of figures now there's a life hack here that i'm going to show you it's not something that counts marks but i know for people who are perfectionistic it actually causes them a, a bit of a pain so i'll show you now 
Insert your table of figures in your table of contents, and then I'll show you what the problem is. All right, firstly, how to fix problems that actually arise for probably most people. Either having blanks in your um, table of contents or having objects in your table of contents or paragraphs that aren't supposed to be there. So in this example, I have a chart that's not supposed to be part of my table of contents. So the easiest thing is to actually control click so that it takes me to that area. And then I need to investigate why this is happening. So this usually happens if the paragraph on which my chart is standing is formatted as a heading style. Do you see that? So literally when my cursor is just standing there by my chart, it's formatted as a heading too. If I've, so if I format that as a normal heading, and if I go back to the top and I update the field, entire table, it removes that. So the same thing happens if there are um, blanks in your table of contents. So if you have lots of like blank paragraphs, and then the same happens if you have big paragraph chunks. Just format them as normal text, then they shouldn't be in your table of contents. And then we've got one more issue here, and that is in the table of figures, we want both the figures, the pictures, so like your charts and your stuff, as well as the tables. We don't just want one of the two. So the way you can insert that is when you're inserting that, instead of using the caption label as the thing to generate the table of figures from, because that's what it's doing at the moment, is it's the way it's generating the table of figures is using the caption label. Instead of that, you can actually generate the table of figures using a style. And that's what we want to do, is we want to build the table of figures from the caption style. And if you do that, then it will show all the captions, no matter if it's table or a figure or a or a tabal. So you see, then it shows the tables and the figures together. Otherwise, if you really want, you can put them as two separate ones. It's not a big deal. All right. The last issue here, and this you don't have to do if you're not a perfectionist. It's just if it bothers you is to fix this, that it doesn't actually show table of contents and table of figures in the table of contents. If this bothers you, you can change the style of this heading to a table of contents heading. So you'll see it's not actually in the options av available here. So you need to go to styles at the bottom and show options. You want all styles to show. And then you need to go and find the TOC heading style. If you apply that to both of these, you'll see it removes it. It looks exactly the same as a heading one and you update the, the table of contents. It removes those two from the table of contents life hack. If it bothers you, it doesn't have to be there, but it can, you can fix it that way. One last thing you need to do before you finished is complete the learner declaration of authenticity. So fill in your name, fill in your ID number, fill in your teacher's name, not my name, your teacher's name. Say who you received help from and you need to be honest here and what they helped you with. So in the least, you need to say Claire Smuts, that's my name, okay? And you need to say that you used my video guides, right? Got to be honest. That's the, the one thing you have to at least say. Put in today's date that you finish it. And then the signature, it's not on paint, guys. Okay, paint is not good enough for a matric final pet. The signature needs to be an actual signature. So make your signature on a piece of white paper. Take a photo of it in good light. Send that picture to yourself on email, preferably, or on WhatsApp. Send it to someone else or make a little group with yourself and send it to yourself and then get it on the computer. Hopefully you have, um, if you have internet access, otherwise connect your phone to the computer using a USB cable and transfer that photo to the computer. That's a good exercise for theory, hey? how you can actually do that. Get it off your email or something like that. Lots of ways, many ways to skin a cat. And then you can insert that picture over here of your signature. And then we are done with phase three's report. So if we look at the report now, 
We are done with the report. That's 48 marks. That's more than halfway through phase three. See you on the flip side. Then we'll carry on with the website.